What's up there, YouTube Live? I am here today with David Chans. Have you ever found, some, found yourself in a situation where you absolutely positively had to make something happen fast financially, and it seemed like the only thing that didn't come fast was money? Well, today we're gonna to be talking about last minute millionaire secrets. When you absolutely positively have to make money in the 11th hour, how do you do that? And other things, because I'm here with David Chans, and you know, like I know, um, that if you're being interviewed by David Chans, he is liable to take a left turn and you will be all up in the <laughs> middle of downtown. So uh, help us with our studio audience. Welcome to the show, Dr. Illustrious David Chans. David Chans, good to you. Appreciate you, guys. Happy to be here, man. Um, I'm going to do my very, very best to stick to this topic. It's all good. We can stick. We can go wherever you desire to go. It's your, it's your interview. Good. Um, okay, because you said something. You said there are people who absolutely have to make money now and fast. Mm -hmm. But do they have to? They feel like they have to. So do they have to? I, I'm sure that's going to vary depending. Yeah. If... if um, your, if you got three days between now and the time you're going to get evicted, probably now would be a good time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, if your electric electricity got disconnected in your house three days ago, probably now would be a good time. Yeah. Um, but if that's the case, they're not watching this video right now. So. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. But right. they've had 30 days, or 60 days, or 90 days, right. or 365 days. Right. But, how do we get from? How do we get here at this yes. point where I have to do it now when we've had so much time? Right, by ignoring the time that we had, or using it to focus on distractions instead of intention. Um, most people find themselves in a right now, last minute situation because of some poor decision making they did somewhere upstream. Generally speaking, that's the case. I mean, obviously, you're going to have situations where that's not the case, where there are some circumstance that came up outside of their control. Maybe a family member got sick, they spent all their money on it. But but the reality is, most. but even that you can prepare for because you know if you've been in, in the world any length of time, people get sick, um, cars get in accidents, refrigerators go out, furnaces go out, roofs leak. So you have to, you have to live your life as if you are adult enough to know that contingencies do happen. Yeah, but right. I mean, we don't think we're making a bad decision in the moment of making a bad decision, or we don't think we are um, procrastinating in the time. It doesn't feel like procrastinating. Like I asked a young lady, did you get your ticket? And she's like, huh, what? You talking to me? I'm looking directly at you. So there's, <laughs> you know you're going, right? You're going to Offer Mastery Live? Yes? You're going? Yes. yes, she's going for sure. She knew she was going right. when she realized that she was going, which right. was probably weeks ago. Well, probably months, but yeah. Months ago. Right. But we don't, we don't, but we but don't, so, but what sometimes, are, what's happening? Well, sometimes, sometimes we do things at the last minute because we are preparing to do them and that preparation does not culminate into fruition until the last minute. That, that's reality sometimes for some people, right? Don't let her off the hook, Myron. I'm not letting her off the hook. I'm just talking about people in general. I'm talking to the people, I'm talking about to the people who are out there in the YouTube sphere. Mm -hmm. There are people, like I've been that guy. I, like, some, some of us didn't even learn the concept of preparing for tomorrow today. Mm. Like, most people grew up, like, if you grew up poor, you grew up sacrificing your tomorrows on the altar of today, right? Wow. But one of the things you grew up, if you grew up in a family with, who's resourceful, then you grow up in a family with resources. If you grow up in a family with resources, you learn the concept of sacrifice. Sacrifice doesn't mean giving up something you desire to do. Sacrifice means letting go of something of a lower nature so you can take a hold of something of a higher nature. And so... Um, I, hold on, whoa, 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 whoa. Letting go of something, something of, of a, a lower nature, nature so you can take a hold of something of a higher nature. So if you ask the question, which one's more a higher nature today or tomorrow, if we sat down and thought about it, tomorrow is, has the potential to be way more valuable than today because I have more time to prepare for it. Somebody said, um, you better spend some time preparing for your future because you're going to spend the rest of your life there. But most <laughs> people are so myopic in the way they think about life in general that they don't spend time preparing for tomorrow because they live in the land of the urgent so the land of the importance gets put off into the future. But today is important if it's urgent, right? It is. And, and if we live that cycle. Yeah, but, there, but, there, but right, but there, there's going to come a time. 
Like, if you are always fixing today's problems today, it's like putting a Band-Aid on an artery, mm. right? Wow. It's not going to stop the bleeding. It's just going to make you feel better about the fact that you did something, yeah. right? And so what we have to do is we have to, we have to, all of us have to be willing to sacrifice the short term on the altar of the long term because if we do the opposite, we're going to live a life of de devastation. It's kind of like the easy hard principle, right? Um, easy on the front end is generally hard on the back end. Hard on the front end is generally easier on the back end. So the road to easy street, street is paved with very hard things. Got it. I, I will admit, we're in the same boat, actually, okay? Because I do things very last minute, too. But okay, but why do you do them? I don't know. It's hereditary, maybe. <laughs> My mom. Wow. He, he blamed it yeah, on my mom. Yeah, my mom, very last minute. Dad, we just had a last minute household. It's not my fault. Um, it, <laughs> perhaps when you were four, it was not your fault. But now that you're probably closer to 40 than four, yeah, you, know, you might want to take some ownership of that, bro. Here's, here's what's interesting, though. Mm -hmm. It always works out. You know what I mean? It's not like I delay and then I feel something. Yeah, but is, is something. working out is okay. But I promise you, working out, everything being okay is not optimal. So it may be good enough to be good enough, but it's certainly not the best it could be. If I've been this for 39 years, mm -hmm. and today I want to start doing things yes. ahead of the time that I need to do them, mm -hmm. where do I start, though? Because I've been, I've been with me my whole life. Yeah, I saw, you, I, I saw both of y'all the whole <laughs> I didn't see y'all the whole time, but since I've known you, yeah, you've been with you. Every, every time I've seen you, you've been with you. For sure. Yeah. And, and <laughs> it just seems like every time I do something at last minute, it happens and we're cool and we're okay. So it's not like there's an urgency to fix it until I had this conversation with you. But, but, but where do I start but, the, but Well, by realizing that if you are working with other people and having a podcast, you work with other people. So mm -hmm. if you're working with other people, then doing things at the last minute can oftentimes create frustration in the lives of the people you work with. They because hate me. They, huh? they hate me. Well, so, so okay. But so, that's a part of my magic, though. Like, last minute, we make a switch. Let's go this way. It worked out. They don't right. like it, but. It, so the mayhem is part of your magic. A little bit. I, okay. I, I wouldn't say it that way, but. You just did. I, I, I don't want to call just it. Did. I want to call it mayhem, though. Like you said, they use, hate just, you, bro. Just use magic. You said no, but no, you said they hate you. I did say that. Yes, that's mayhem. And so, so here's the reality. Can I give you my rationale? You can, but. When you rationalize, you know that means you're just telling yourself rational lies. No, go no. ahead. Give me your rationale. I don't want to do it anymore, Myron. Why? <laughs> nah, go ahead. Say what you were saying. Say what you were saying. I thought you were interviewing me. What are we yeah, doing? Yeah, I don't what know. What, I don't know what, what this we is. We're doing. What are we doing? All right, so I, here's the I thing. I didn't realize we were doing an intervention I'm, for David's <laughs> procrastination. What are we, what is this? I am preparing them to think on their feet as right. I do. Okay. Right. Rationale. Right. Are you preparing them to think on their feet or forcing them to do it? That's the question, though. No, I, I, all I'm saying is, <laughs> no. <laughs> this, I don't want this to be about me, Myron. Let's, this, this, let's this, continue this with conversation, the conversation. <laughs> this conversation went, it went left like fast. Um, <sighs> so no, but 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 what I'm doing. So why why am I having this conversation with you? Because there are a lot of people who believe what you're saying is true for them. Yeah. But as good as your life is right now, doing it the way you're doing it right now, if you start preparing in advance for things, it will make every aspect of what you do better, period. Mm -hmm. Like, when I'm teaching a lesson, the ones that I thought about, that I thought about and meditated on and sat down and figured out what my, what my illustrations are gonna be in advance, those have been the ones that are like killer, killer. Mm. Right? When I, like, if I teach on a biblical passage, for instance, if I teach on a biblical passage and, and it's something I'm really, really familiar with, that's okay. But when I do a word study on every word in the passage and look up the meaning of the word in its original language, 
and then I take all of those definitions and I put them together and then I understand the concept better. The more time I have in preparation of anything, okay. You like basketball, you're wearing a 76ers hat. You ready? Let's go. What's the difference between a professional and an amateur in any arena? Time, attention, skill. Okay. I submit to you that the difference between a professional and an amateur is an amateur spends four to ten times more time performing than they do preparing, but a professional spends four to ten times more time preparing than they do performing. Hmm. Like, there are a lot of amateur athletes out there that like to play basketball on the weekend or like to play golf on the weekend or like to play softball or whatever, and they'll work out every now and then so they don't injure themselves, and they might stretch for 15 minutes, but you take somebody who's at the top of the game in their game, who's one of the best in the world, they'll spend 8 to 12 hours a day just, like, preparing. Like, people spend four hours to watch a football game. They may play, um, people in the game may spend 27 minutes in that game, but they will spend tens of hours getting their body and their mind ready for that game. Wow. You take a, a movie that's a blockbuster movie, the actors that are professional actors, they will spend hundreds of hours memorizing the scripts and then memorizing the feelings that go into those scripts. And what, we, what oftentimes we desire to do as people is we desire to prepare like an amateur and perform like a pro and then get paid like we're the best in the world. <laughs> and, and because it's so easy to make money right now, it's, it's easier right now to create wealth than it's ever been in, our, in the history of the world. Because it's easier right now to do that, what we do is we get ready a little bit and we go out into an arena where it's easy to crush it and we crush it and we're okay with that because it's better than we, we're, we're doing better than we were and we're doing better than most people around, around us are. And so we think we're doing as well as we could do it and we ain't even in the neighborhood. Wow. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, I, yes. It, sure. You, like, let's say, let's say you make $10 million a year and you, oh my goodness, I'm the blah, 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 I'm killing the game. Okay, cool. But $10 million a year is great if that's the max of your potential. It's not great if the max of your potential is $500 million. And it's not because of the money. The money's just the money. It's because why would I want to be anything less than the best I can be? Why would I want to do anything less than the best I can do? Why would I want to have anything less than the best I can have? Like, if the purpose of life is to fill your life with experiences and not just to have so many years of experience doing a thing, if it's to fill up my life with experiences, why would I want those experiences to be anything less than the best experiences possible? In every arena, if that's doable. And it's certainly more doable than we've all been doing. Does that make sense? It does. Um, what is your preparation routine? Because you didn't like study to talk about this today. No. What has your preparation been? To be honest, the way you articulate words is something like I've never seen before, right? So, and I've been actually in my car practicing. <laughs> I'm my journey. I get that. Like, uh, I get no, that. I mean, I, I like how you illustrate and then like even like the tree up and down thing. Right. Now I'm looking for stuff that grows a certain right. way. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all yeah, really laugh? I, this is me. Is no, it, this is not a safe space? Bro, bro. So, so here's the reality. Um, there are different components of communication, right? There is, there is the, conceptualization, the conceptualization of the content. Like, that's where I spend, like, that's where most of my time is spent in conceptualizing, uh, collecting, like, collecting information that seems unrelated. So, um, I don't know that there's any such thing as an uninteresting topic. There are only disinterested people. Hmm. Right? And so, everything is really fascinating. We're just not fascinated enough. And so the more fascinated we become about different things, we start seeing similarities in different places, like from things that seem like they shouldn't have anything to do with each other. We start seeing connections. And when you start seeing those connections, the connection of this new thing that you just learned sheds light on this old thing that you knew. And now you know it in a way that you couldn't have known it had you not learned this new thing. Right? And so, so how do I spend my time? I just spend my time learning about stuff that's interesting to me. That's how, 
and then and then thinking about it, and sometimes for way longer than you should think about a thing, <laughs> right? I flip it over. You know they say if you're cooking like burgers on the grill, you should only flip them once. Mm -hmm. Man, I'll take a thought and flip it over back. <laughs> Time I get there, ain't no juice left in the thought. We just, we just flipping it over. Let me bring it to a, a real practical thing. Mm -hmm. So you have this event coming up, mm -hmm. Offer Mastery Live. Offer Mastery Live. The event is going to be three days? Two three days. days. Three days. Mm -hmm. How much time did you prepare for these three days? Like, what is the process of so putting this together? Preparing for... <laughs> uh, oh, well, there's, like, preparing for the event is different than preparing to speak at the event. Are you asking me about preparing to speak at the event? First, the event itself. Like, conceptualize, like... Okay. Do we say, you know, I want to do an event. Book the venue. So, let's go. Okay. So, so if, if we're going to create anything, ideally, we could go back to Genesis and look how God established things. Right? I think he was going to do that. <laughs> well, that's the like, way. Uh, Mario, you'll say something like, the event is in Genesis. It's not in there, bro. <laughs> you took that and you made something cool. No, okay, I, ahead, I, I observed this. I observed okay. this. See, that's one of those connections, right? Yes, yes. Okay, has there ever been a more productive week than the first week of existence when God made everything out of nothing? No. So that's no, pretty yeah. productive. Extremely. Right? That's pretty productive. For sure. Right, okay. Well, I don't, I get, at least I get to start with some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right, right. So, so if he can make everything out of nothing in a week and I made it in his image, I, if I've got a couple of months, I should be able to pull something off. For sure. Okay. For sure. So... Here's what it says in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So in the beginning, that's time. So I need to pick a time I'm going to do the thing. Mm. God created the heavens. That's a space. I need to pick a place. Then I need, once I pick the place, I need to make sure the place that I pick has the time that I picked. And if I don't, I need to pick a new time. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, okay, what did we desire to do in this place? And so we're going to need audio. We're going to need visuals. We're going to need, um, we're going to need, production and staging and all of that stuff. So who are the people who do this? And then you reach out to those people. And so, and you have, you, there are so many moving parts that you have to coordinate that it's ideal that you delegate different aspects of an event like that to different people who have skill sets in that arena. Mm -hmm. um, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, he wasn't just talking about marriage. Human beings attempting to do things by themselves are always going to underperform. Ah, oh, that's good. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but a lot of times people will underperform and do things by themselves because either they think they're better at it than everybody else, and while you may be better at some things than everybody else, you're not better at everything than everybody else. So oftentimes we're going to be better off having a chef cook our food and a cleaning service clean our house and a pool service service our pool and a mechanic work on our car instead of us doing everything so we can save the money. Because when we're saving the money, we're wasting the time that we could use to become a person who could afford to spend the money mm -hmm. and still have more money left over than the money we're saving by doing the thing ourselves. Wow. Right? Okay, so there's, there's that preparation. And then you've got teams of people who are working on different aspects of that. Um, and then, as far as the preparation that I do, personally, for speaking, it's going to sound so off and so weird. I'll have a general idea of the concepts that I desire to convey. And I don't recommend that anybody do it this way. Like, I can get away with this because I'm 62. And what happens, what, to your last minute thing, sometimes I will prepare something that I'm going to talk about, and then I'll walk in the room, and I'll have a couple of conversations with a couple of different people, or I'll hear a couple of different people having conversations I wasn't even a part of, or I'll just watch another speaker speak and realize the big gaping hole they left in the idea that they were conveying, and I know that I need to shift and communicate a very different thing. Does that make sense? Yes, so I believe that a prepared messenger is better than a prepared message. And I attempt to be a prepared messenger by knowing as much as I possibly can about my area of, quote, expertise yeah. so that I can be ready instant in season, out of season. That's good. If we're not your message, but like the ethos or the feel of the event, mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you creating? The purpose isn't to have a bunch of people in a room and no. teach them something. No. No. What is the purpose of the event? I, I think the purpose of every interaction that we have with every human being we ever have an interaction with should be 
to make the quality of that person's life better when they leave our presence than it was when they get, when they got, came into our presence. That, I, I believe that's the objective because I believe the twofold purpose of every human being is to please God and serve people. And so if, if we're looking for a different objective, we might find it only to find out we found something that we wish we had not been looking for, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. right? For me, I found that if I'm seeking to please God and I'm seeking to serve people, you can't lose with the stuff I use. And so, so I've learned things, and I, I don't, I'm not the smartest guy in the world by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively intelligent, you know? I mean, I've been here for 62 years. I should know something mm -hmm. about something, for sure. right? Um, but I believe I've learned some things. I, I, why do I talk about, so a lot of people wonder, why do you talk about money all the time? Well, because I know that's an arena in people's lives that they struggle with the most, and it's really not that complicated. It's only complicated if you're, if you're doing your money experience in life around a bunch of misinformation. The money subject isn't complicated or the accumulation of it? Uh, creating, well, first of all, the accumulation of money, like, is, is that really a desired outcome anyway? Yeah. Well, people think it is. Yeah. But I, th I submit to you that I believe that money is, a person with money is going to be better off if they view it as a tool to be used than they will if they view it as a pool to be viewed. Explain that. Okay. So when I went to Israel a couple years ago, 2021 exactly, to be exact, one of the places we ended up, like on our next to the last day, we went to the Dead Sea. So there's a sea at the northern part of Israel called the Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. There's a river that flows from the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the south into the Dead Sea. Why is the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? Why is the Dead Sea, like, like fish can't live in it. Crabs can't live in it. It's just a shark. You don't have to worry about a shark in the Dead Sea. Yeah. The Dead Sea, by the way, is a mate. Like the water in the Dead Sea, be, the, anyway, that's a different conversation. What does it look like? Looks like looks like the beach, like clear water. Yeah, pretty clear. But nothing can live in there. When I right. think of the Dead Sea, I'm thinking, no, all right, no, muddy no. swamp. Oh no, no, it's not a swamp. No, it's 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 like there are, there are, there are luxury hotels that are built along the Dead Sea, the beach of the Dead Sea, and they funnel water from the Dead Sea into their swimming pools, or not swimming pools, into their floating pools, in their hotel. And why can't something live there then? And anybody think about like a dead sea, you think it was like... It's super? dead. Well, because it's dead, because things can't live in it. But here's what happens, though. You can float it. It's a mineral deposit. It's got mineral deposits. But here's why the dead sea's dead, because it only has an inlet. It doesn't have any outlets. Same thing with Salt Lake City. The Great Salt Lake is a dead sea because it has inlets, but it has no outlet. And so, so money, like... Cash flow is infinitely more important than cash accumulation. Mm. Infinitely more important. But a lot of people, what they're doing is, I'm not saying, <clears throat> I'm not saying that acquiring some cash, like cash accumulation for a purpose is a bad idea. Yeah. I think the, the idea that most people think is a great idea for a reason to accumulate cash is a terrible idea. Because yeah. um, most people only would desire to accumulate cash for retirement. And that's fine if that's what you would desire to do. But I've just noticed that shortly after people retire, they expire. And I have no <laughs> desire to retire because I have no <laughs> desire to expire. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> right? Okay. However, and, and the scripture says, lay not for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust does corrupt and thieves do break through and steal. But it also says, that same Bible also says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So the wealth that I accumulate, I'm not accumulating for me. Mm -hmm. I'm accumulate, accumulating for the future generations that come from me so that my children and my grandchildren don't have to start from scratch. Yeah. Right? Um, so, but I have no desire to retire, even though I have retirement accounts. The only reason I have retirement accounts is because it saves me money on my taxes, and I can either give it to the government or give it to myself, and I'd rather give it to myself, even if I end up just leaving it to my children. Right? Smart. Okay. So, um, so but making, a, making money, is, it's easier now to make money than it's ever been in human history. Making, it's easier to make a lot of money now than it's ever been in human history. Um, it's easier to develop massive amounts of cash flow now than it's ever been in human history, but it doesn't feel like it. And the reason it doesn't feel like it is because most people are attempting to earn a living in the past. And so my objective for having Offer Mastery Live 
is to show people that there is a better way to create wealth for your family and to make money to sustain life than just hustling and grinding and going to a nine to five that you hate to work for a boss who hates you to make less money than it takes for you to survive. <laughs> There's, there are better ways to live than that. You said something about people trying to make money in the past? Yeah. yeah. I don't understand. Oh, I know. Not, I mean, not that I know you don't understand, but most people don't because we get all of our cues from the past on what to do now from the past, but the past does not really give us a good, like past performance is no indicator of future performance, right? Yeah. Not an indicator. In fact, it's an indicator that things are gonna be different. And if you look at the agricultural age, and then the industrial age, and then the, the um, distribution age, and then the information age, and then the technology age, and then, uh, I said, um, the technology age, then the information age, and then the techno info entertainment age, and then the partnership age, the wealth that was created in each one of those economic eras is very different. But our parents told us what to do to do better. But what worked for them to do better won't work for us. I see. I right? See. So go to college, study hard, get good grades so you can graduate, get a good job with a good company that'll take care of you. So did you go to college? Yes. Did you graduate? No. Okay, congratulations. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that Robert Kiyosaki says that I find so fascinating is that A students work for C students and B students work for the government. <laughs> what? I, that's what Robert Kiyosaki oh, says. I like that. Right? And so, um, but you'll find people who did graduate from college. Like, you will find many of them. Just go to a high-end restaurant. They will be waiting on you at your table. And I'm not, be, I'm not being disrespectful. No, a I'm little not, bit. I'm not a even, little no, bit I'm not. No. This is an observation. There's no disrespect intended. They're willing to work. At least they're not like, like acting like they didn't go borrow the money. But the whole, the whole, what if? I'm not saying it is, but what if? The whole, go to college, study hard, get good grades. There are people who definitely, like I've got a friend I play golf with. He's an engineer. He builds bridges. Get good grades. I drive across those bridges, <laughs> right? Right. Like, let's 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 go to college. Let's get some good grades. If you're going to have my son-in-law just like recently had an appendectomy, you're going to be taking like cutting into people's bodies and yeah. taking stuff out. They should excel. Study hard, get good grades. But telling all children to go to study hard, get good grades, so you can go to college, so you can graduate and get a good job. Well, first of all, it's it's not only not accurate; it's just a lie. Mm -hmm. And the only like. The only ones who benefit from that are the colleges. Yeah. I mean, largely from that large scale lie. If you're going to do things that require a college degree, go to college. If you know you desire to do something that requires a college degree, go to college. Get good grades, study hard so you can get a good job in that arena. But if you don't even know what you're going to do, if you don't know what you're going to do, go to college and find yourself. Most people go to college and lose themselves. That's a fact. It is a fact. And so the whole, that, that whole concept. So it, it made sense in the industrial age to go to college so you'd get a good grade so you didn't have to work in the factory anymore. You could manage the people who worked in the factory. It yeah. doesn't make sense anymore, any more than you're going to tell your children, hey, you know what? When you grow up, go buy a farm like, and start farming. Now, there are some aspects of farming that are appealing to me. Yeah. But, but not, it's not the money-making aspects. Yeah. You follow me? That this this right. does make sense. I, I, uh, yes. Think about think about think about how new AI is and how many multi multi millionaires and billionaires AI has already created in the last two years. Well, my parents couldn't tell me anything about AI. It didn't exist in their lifetime. Yeah. As an entrepreneur too, and maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but there are. I, I think there was a, 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 a era where if you recorded a course. Mm -hmm. You sold the course for nine ninety seven. You make a bunch of money, mm -hmm. but people weren't familiar with courses like that. Right. So all these course platforms start to pop up. Sure, and it almost seems ineffective or silly from my perspective, where someone says today, "I'm going to start my I'm going to like record a course and sell it." It seems like there's. And then I came into. Um, uh, uh, make more offers, and you teach about challenges and offer mastery. And I'm like, whoa, this is a different way. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that kind of like the set up a course, now I'm going to make a bunch of money, doesn't work as effectively as it did four or five years ago. Well, it doesn't work as effectively. Four or five years ago, there were some people it wasn't effective for them. Yeah. Right? Because the reality is 
everybody who creates a course isn't good at the thing they're teaching the course about. So let's start with being good at something. Let's start with having a skill. Yeah. Let's start with knowing something that a big pool of people desire to know and are willing to pay to learn. Yeah. Right? So if you're good at something that a big pool of people desire to know and they're willing to pay a lot to learn, then you can still create a course for $1,000 and make a decent income. You only have to sell 1,000 of them a year mm -hmm. to make like a million dollars. So that's, that's pretty cool. Like 200, what would that be? That'd be 50 weeks in a year? 200 of them in a year, mm -hmm. or 200 of them a week, right? No, that's not, that's not even, that's too many. 200 a month. That's 50 courses a week for $1,000. You make a million dollars a year. About three a day. Yeah. Is it about three a day? Mm-hmm. 365 times three. Math was the only subject I was good at. Okay, so there you have it. <laughs> what, what you just said. But I'm saying, it, but, but there was an... Yeah, but okay, no, that's, not, that's not true. Like, that would be $3.6 million, bro. No. No? No, that'd be three hundred sixty. That'd be three thousand dollars a day. Yeah, right, three thousand dollars a day. Yeah. That's true. You're right. Okay. But so, so for so instance, exactly. se check this out. And no slight. Network marketing industry, right? Mm -hmm. There was a there was an explosion of the industry mm -hmm. where no one ever seen it before. You're like, right. oh my gosh, but, I can but, recruit but, it came, people? It, but that concept was created in the distribution age. The right. same e economic era as infomercials and malls and the discount stores and, and those shopping networks. Anymore. Right. It's not that they don't work. What, well, the as reason, well. They don't work as well. Yeah. And the reason, because more people know about it, number one, but also, like, the, most, of the people, most of the people who desire to do network marketing are already doing it, and so most people who make money in network marketing do it by switching companies and then taking a whole bunch of people to Correct. a new opportunity. Yeah. Um, and so it's not that that's necessarily a bad thing. It is what it is. It's the nature of that industry. But, like, for instance, I recently bought a guitar mastery course. Right, an eight thousand dollar guitar mastery course. Oh wow! Right, so that's fairly significant when you can buy a guitar lesson online for fifty bucks, forty mm -hmm. bucks, right, from a YouTube from a YouTube guitarist. Yeah. And I bought some of those courses as well. So, so here's 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 how you make money. I'm going to tell you the the bottom line of making money. You ready? Find somebody, find a big pool of people with a problem that's painful. Obsess over solving it so that you can solve it in the most elegant way. Hmm. Let them know you've created the solution. Remove the risk from them participating in that solution. It's virtually impossible for you not to become wealthy. Hold on. Did someone get all of those steps? Mm -hmm. What was the first one? Big pool of people. Find a big pool of people. Let's just... So, With a massive so problem. Walk, just make sure we have this list. Right. How do we identify a problem that has a big pool of people? Let's, let's, well, let's start with problems that we have. Right? right? What problems do we have? So when I first got started as an entrepreneur, one problem I had is I couldn't sell. I didn't have the skill. I didn't even know it was a skill. I just knew I, I wasn't good at it. And if you're not good at something, you're generally not going to like it. So I wasn't good at it, and I didn't like it. <laughs> but it was the only arena I had ever seen where back in the 80s, this guy that I met was making 10000 a month, and he wasn't that good of a communicator. Mm. He was lower end of average at best. <laughs> right? But he was in a multi-level marketing company that sold financial services. So, Rich, remind me, ask me about, like, what is the foundational component to make people successful in multi-level marketing? Because it's pretty true across all industries, but it's even more true in network marketing. So remind me about that. Okay. So Hey, remind me about that. <laughs> okay. You so, understand? Tim okay. got you. Tim got you. Okay. So, so what happens is, so we find a big pool of people. So I couldn't sell. Guess what I realized after I'd been in multi-level marketing for a long time? What's I that? wasn't the only one who couldn't sell. Eventually, I got good at selling. Guess what people did? They asked me to teach them. Huh? Mm. What are people coming to you and asking you about a lot? Asking for your advice on a lot. What if you start charging them just a little? Mm. How does that change your life? I like that. Right? Um, so another way to find a big problem, like a big pool of people with a problem, go find a how-to book on a subject. Any book that's a bestseller that's a how-to book, there's a big pool of people. This is good. Right? This is good. This right? is a hack. Oh, 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 but it gets more better. Talk to me. Okay. You find a, a best-selling book. Find a magazine in a category. 
If there is a magazine for a category, <laughs> there is a big pool of people. Why? Because magazines make money by selling ads to people who want to reach the people that subscribe to that magazine. You can literally go home and turn on your electronic income reducer, the television, <laughs> and you can like just go through the, the guide, you know, the, the, the one that's got the channel guide, tells mm -hmm. you what, what's on every show. Yeah. Just go through and look for niche shows like um, how to renovate houses, how to um, go to pawn shops and buy stuff, um, how to go through storage, storage unit auctions, mm -hmm. right? Those are all big pools of people who have stuff that they watch. Like, millions of people watch people go open other people's storage sheds. I, like, it blows my mind, <laughs> right? So if there's a TV show about it, there's a big pool of people who are interested in it. If there's a magazine about it, there's That's a big so pool of people. Good. If there's a best-selling book on the subject, there's a big pool of people. So, like, go find one of those arenas that you're really good at. Start making some noise so these people can find you. I love that. What was the next one? What was the next one on the steps? Big pool of people. A problem with that. We went through that. What was okay. the next one? Obsess over solving. Obsess over solving. What does that look like? Um, well, for me, in the beginning, it looked like reading a lot of books. Like, so, my, I remember my very first book that I ever read on sales. It was Tom Hopkins, How to Master the Art of Selling Anything. Mm -hmm. And, like, if I had to tell you what the whole book was about, I couldn't do it. But I got two concepts from that book that changed my life. Share. Number one, he said, if you're going to get good at sales, you must learn to love no. Learn to love no. Yes. You must learn to love no. See, a lot of people are terrible at sales because they would rather have a forever maybe than a right now no. <laughs> right? And so for me, my motto is tell me yes or tell me no, but tell me now I got to go. Like, I like right? That. S W S W S W S W N. Some will, some won't. So what? Someone's waiting. Next. People think that the job, the job of the salesperson, is to turn a no into a yes. But if you want to get good at selling, sift and sort. Don't don't transform. Like if I said if I said we're going to take these four people in the front row, we're going to give them all the deck of cards. You're going to shuffle the cards. I'm going to give $100 to the person. Turn the cards over face down. Okay, the person who finds, we're going to give them all a black marker, a red marker, and some white out. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they got a, each got a deck of cards. Per, first person to turn over, four aces wins. So the person takes the card off. It's a, it's a three. They take out their white out. They, they white out the three, one, two of the white, two of the spades. And they leave one, they white out the, the number two, and they mark it with number one. Okay, I got one ace. By the time they get done with that one card, the person who's going to win has already won. And so what happens is, in, if you think of sales as a race for the aces, instead of turning threes into aces and turning fours into aces and turning fives into aces and turning tens into aces, if you think of it as a race for the aces, instead of turning a non-buyer into a buyer, it changes the game for you. So just go through the deck and find just, aces. Yeah. And the, bet, the fastest way to get to a yes is go through a bunch of no's. I think I kind of understand what you're doing now. Okay. okay. So, so what am I doing? <laughs> let's say, because you teach doing events and you teach um, challenges and getting a, a big group of people together to ask them the same question. Sure. Whoever says yes to the question, that's who you're selling to. Right, but it's, it's bigger than that even. So it's, it's understanding that the world is full of problems. The people who become the best problem solvers are the ones who get the lion's share of all the good stuff. What does it mean to serve somebody? It means to deliver something they value to them. It doesn't mean to deliver something you value to them. That's what most people think service is. Well, this is the thing I like to do, so this is what I do, and I just want people to pay me for it. Well, only, that only makes sense if they desire to have it done. Does that make sense? Yes. And so, so most people are really, really bad at sales. I'm really, really good at sales, so I teach people how to sell. Most people are bad at growing businesses. In fact, 80% of businesses fail in the first three years. I'm really good at 
building, like scaling businesses. Why? Because I, I like to look at seemingly complex things, boil them down into their most minute components, and then like go do these few things. Yeah. Right? The truth is always simple. It's lies that are complicated. What does it look like for someone to obsess, though? I mean, I'm, I'm still... Okay, uh, I'll tell you, I don't know I'm, what it I've looks never like done for research, someone, really. But I can tell you what it looks like for me to obsess. Talk to me. So first, I obsessed over solving my own problem, because I am a people. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so my problem was, I was poor most of my life. And, and people can talk about the virtues of being poor all they want to. In my mind, it has no virtue. Like, it's just not virtuous. It's not fun. It's not helpful. <laughs> It's not helpful when you look at your wife and your children and you know you can't keep the lights on. And that was me. Like, like I, I literally smiled last week. I thought, man, it has been so long since I've had my electricity turned off. It just made me smile, <laughs> right? Because, like, and, and, and that may sound like, what? Yeah, yeah. My wife was eight months pregnant with our first child. Our electricity and water were both disconnected at the same wow. time. So you're not, you can't convince me or persuade me of the virtues of that, Right? Uh, my brother was here a couple of years ago, um, and he got sick when he was here. And he's a pastor in Pennsylvania. He got sick, ended up having to have intestinal surgery while he was here. He's in the hospital for 10 days, lost a lot of weight, and he wasn't that big to begin with, mm -hmm. right? And um, he finally gets out of the hospital. He's going back home. And, like, I can just see some chucklehead on a plane dropping a suitcase on his incision. I'm like, that ain't happening. Mm. And I was able to charter a plane, and the only people on that plane were the two pilots and him and his wife, uh. right? That has value to me, right? Um, and so, so I obsessed over how do I solve my poverty problem? Like, I hate poverty. How do I beat it so far away from the door that it cannot find its way back? Hmm. And when I figured that all of that stuff out, I just started sharing those ideas with people. And guess what? They, there are a lot of people out there who care about it as much as I do. Who knew? That's a thing, right? You're a podcaster. You have a very, very, like, I, 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 think, I think I can say this truthfully. Kind of like my first, the first time the world discovered me was on your podcast, that first podcast interview we did, right? My, and in like maybe eight months, our YouTube subscribers went from 5,000 to 10,000 in like eight months from that YouTube interview. Oh. Now, to me, that was a lot of people. It's, it still is, but like it started on the Social Proof podcast, right, with you. And, and I thought, wow, people are really interested in the stuff I have to say. That's, <laughs> I, I was kind of fascinated I, because I'm interested in it. It doesn't necessarily mean people are interested, yeah. but clearly they were. And so I obsessed by reading books on the subject, going to seminars, listening to audio programs. My daughter called me this morning. She said, what's he doing? I said, I'm studying how to be a better communicator. She said, what are you reading? Well, I'm not really reading right now. I'm on a website, and I'm just kind of, I bought this course, mm -hmm. and it was 2200 bucks a couple years ago. I'm just studying it. And then uh, a lady who's in my mastermind, her name's Nika, Nika Maples. Uh, she'll be speaking at Offer Mastery Live. Mm -hmm. um, amazing lady. Um, she had a stroke when I think she was 22 and has had a whole lot of obstacles to overcome that since then. But her, she's a brilliant entrepreneur. And she wrote a book called From Word One to Word Done, and she coaches people on becoming authors. And so she wrote a book from work, and I was looking at the book, I was like, wow, this guy has some really good stuff in it. So I'm like, I took that book out because so I'm gonna be studying Nika's book because my desire is to get become a better communicator. Um, and so obsessing means that good enough is never good enough, and it's good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better is best. That's what obsessing looks like to me. <laughs> it's like, yes, I'm talking to you about practice. Yeah. Practice. <laughs> right? So that's what it, that's what obsession looks like to me. Gotcha. Okay. Constant and never-ending improvement. I love that. What was another one? Was it another one? Was it obsess over? Okay. Let the marketplace know, know that, that you've obsessed, obsessed over. over this thing. Yes. That's a little harder because we can obsess Not, and we. It's never been easier though. I mean. I'm talking about for somebody, they're just in the research mode and they like they check the website and change the words a million times, but now we check gotta the let website. the world know. Yeah. What do you mean? What website? Make sure the website that they have where the word well, copy you, or make sure the but, color's the right pantone. No, 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 no. We're not talking about selling anything to anybody yet. We're just talking about letting the world know you have like you have the solution. We're not even talking about like you haven't created anything. That, has, that hasn't been easy for a lot of people though. 
No, it's easy. It's not that it's, it's okay, it's, it's both easy, at, yes, it is. Yes, it is. There's YouTube. Yes, no, I'm not, I, no, I'm not going to agree with that. No, because, because YouTube doesn't know any of us when we first start creating videos. All of us are on equal footing when we start creating videos. Um, Jimmy, Mr. Beast started the same place every other YouTube will ever start. You started the same place every other YouTube. I started the same place every other YouTube will start. Except most YouTubers are way smarter than me because I showed you this morning. Like I was on YouTube for 15 years. I didn't even know like they paid people money for YouTube videos <laughs> for 15 years, right? Um, so yes, like my parents didn't have YouTube. You cannot tell me with a platform like YouTube that exists for the purpose of showing people, other people, and stuff they care about, that it's not easy. It is easy, but you still have to do it, yeah. right? Um, Jim Rohn said, he said, you know, I was broke from age, age from the time I was born to age 26. So at 26, I met Mr. Show, started working. By the time, from age 26 to age 30, I became a millionaire. People say, Mr. Rohn, Mr. Rohn, how did you become a millionaire? From age 26 to age 30, he said it was easy. It was easy. <laughs> and here's what I mean by easy. Here's my definition of easy. It was something I could do. He said, but here's the thing about easy. What's easy to do is also easy not to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, I just took the lesser of two easies. It's so easy not to put it up. It's easy not to put it out there. I wasn't consistent on YouTube for my first 15 years. It was easy not to be consistent. Guess what? Now I'm consistent. We post something every day. Guess what? It's, it's still easy. Imagine if I had to go knock on every, if, imagine, like, I, I think we had 1.5 million views in the last 28 days. Imagine I had to go knock on 1.5 million people's doors in 28 days to share my message. That would be hard. <laughs> Putting a YouTube video on YouTube and letting YouTube find the people for it, that ain't hard. <laughs> and I might not even be good at it first. But it's kind of like walking and learning like your ABCs. You do it consistently enough over a long enough period of time, you're going to get good at it. Yes. Why don't people do it, though? Outside of being easy to do, because, there's going to be... Because it's easy not to do. But I don't like my voice. I'm right. nervous. Okay. Right, right. Because, oh, okay. so, because they're self-absorbed. Dang, man. It's kind of harsh. Is that harsh? Really? A, a that little. doesn't feel harsh. I mean, not. okay, okay. If I'm think, if, if I have a solution for you, yes. and I don't bring it to you because I'm too busy thinking about me, am I absorbed with you or me? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I'm, I didn't feel harsh. It's just it's it's an observation. It's not an attack, <laughs> right? It's just like. Can you imagine EMT coming to somebody's bloody on the ground, they're bleeding? Dude, help them. Well, yeah, but my outfit, I just got out of the cleaners. <laughs> like, what is that? What is that? Your outfit? Really? That's what we're talking about? Am I oh, missing God. something, Chance? Anybody feel attacked? Anybody <laughs> feel attacked? Okay, okay. You feel attacked? Okay, good. <laughs> Hey, you know what the Apostle Paul said? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Mm. <laughs> Faith for the wounds of a friend, brother, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Sometimes you got to hurt somebody to help them. If you don't believe me, ask your dentist. <laughs> right? You got to hurt them to help them. Some, if you don't believe me, ask the surgeon. You got to hurt them to help them. Sometimes you got to hurt people to help them. I like that. But if, you don't, you're not, if you're not willing to help them to hurt them, I mean, if you're not willing to hurt them to help them, then you are helping them to harm them, which is far worse because that's long term. Wow. The pain of the initial hurt that helps will eventually go away. And then you get to live with the benefit from now on. But if you don't tell them, and you want to be helpful right on the front end, and you don't tell them, dude, you have slobber on your face. If you don't tell them, dude, you really need to, like, shut down some mints right now, right? <laughs> if you don't tell them that, you're, you're being nice, but you're not being kind. Wow. And I'd rather be kind and tell the truth the nice and just lie to people and make them feel good about disaster. Man, you said something that, and I can't get it out of my head, and I was trying to move on. <laughs> I don't know if you chose these words intentionally, but you said... I choose all my words intentionally, brother. Let, Seriously. Because you would think that the first step is letting the world know what you do, but you said let the world know that you have obsessed just, about a thing. Yes, that you obsessed over their problem. Okay, if you watch my YouTube channel, you may disagree with me, but you know I've obsessed over some stuff. <laughs> this brother, is, he's kind of obsessive, sure. right? So, so, like, I didn't just wake up one day and say, huh, just throw something together, right? It doesn't work like that. Like, 
people want to know, if, you know what happens when, when people can see clearly that you've obsessed over their problem more than they have? They will trust you. Hmm. They'll trust you in ways they can't even trust themselves. Let the world know that you're obsessed. I, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I think in a space of like podcasting, I think people feel that I'm obsessed about this thing. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. But I think I had some products or services that I sold that maybe I was good at it, but I didn't let them know that this is my world. Right, this is your everything This. I think you helped a lot of people today. That was really, really good. You know why I helped them? Because I was willing to hurt them. Because <laughs> you're being kind, not nice. I like that. That's what I'm going to tell my wife. I'm being kind. The reason I said that. Bro, this is not marriage counseling. You can't blame this. Mrs. I can't Shan, be nice right now, Mrs. bro. Shan. I was being kind. Mrs. Shan. He did not get that. Okay. The concept of offer mastery. Yes. Could have named it anything. Yes. How do you master offers? How do you master? Uh, how do you master anything? That's the question. Let's start with that. How do you master any? Like, what is an offer and how do you master anything? Hmm? I for sure would have obsession in there. Okay. Got it? So, for, so let me define mastery first. What is mastery? What does mastery look like? Mastery to me looks like the ability to execute effortlessly without the use of conscious resources. Execute effortlessly without the, the use, use of, of conscious, conscious resources. resources. Let me show you something. Watch this. This is good. Not really. Untied shoe. Uh -oh. Watch this. Okay. <laughs> without the, looking, the look away. Without looking. The no look shoe tie. I'm impressed. Do you? Oh, it gets better. Do you know how long it took me to do that when I first started? It felt uh. impossible. It felt impossible. When I first learned to tie my shoe, it took weeks, and it felt impossible. The same thing riding a bike. Can you imagine me being 62 years old and saying, can somebody tie my shoes? Because they haven't mastered it. See, we won't let our children off the hook. We let ourselves off the hook all the time. What is mastery? Mastery is the ability to execute effortlessly without the use of conscious resources. How do I do that? Repeated iterations. Wow, do it repeatedly when you're bad at it, long enough to get good at it. And most people will do it, attempt to do it once, twice, 15 times, and if it doesn't work out of the gate, they're like, I'm gonna go do something else, this is too hard. Really? Too hard for you. You've learned mm -hmm. how to walk. You've learned how to talk, you've learned how to ride a bike, you've learned how to run, you've learned how to drive a car, use a computer, use a phone, cook, brush your teeth, floss your teeth. You've learned all of these things, and this next thing all of a sudden is too hard for you. If we desire to understand how easy everything is, or how doable, maybe not even easy, how doable everything is for us, all we have to do is look in the rearview mirror of our life and know that when we landed on this planet, we couldn't do anything for ourselves. All of the things that we've already mastered ought to let us know there's nothing we can't learn. Oh my gosh. Can we get a little round of applause? That was good. <laughs> this might have been, this is like top three interviews I've ever done. This really? Is so, oh, this is so good. This is so good. Cool. So, but we didn't talk about what an offer is. So, so. Hold on. Before we get okay. into. You want to uh, stay on mastery? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. let's stay on mastery. Um, what are the elements of mastery? Like, how do you know that you've mastered it? Is there some sort of way that we can test it? When it feels effortless and it's still excellent. When, it's, when it feels effortless to you but it's apparent to everybody else and to you, it's excellent. You mastered it. Okay. How do we master the offer? Well, let's define well, what, what is the offer. Let's yes. define what an offer is. So most people think an offer is something you beg people to take from you and give you in exchange for money. I wouldn't say big, but... Some people. Some people think big. Like, please do me a favor, come on. <laughs> I really need to make a sale to meet my quota. Right? There's some people, that's their presentation. Yeah. Um, some people think it's something you have to convince people to do. But I submit to you that convincing something, somebody to do something is what people resort to because they're bad at selling. Selling is not convincing. Selling is the opposite of convincing. Selling is persuasion. What is persuasion? Persuasion is 
Well, let me tell you what convincing is first. Convincing is when I attempt to get you to do something I desire you to do for my reasons. Mm -hmm. Persuasion is when I help you make a decision you already desire to make for your own reasons. So if I'm convincing you, I'm thinking about me, but if I'm persuading you, I'm, I'm obsessed with you, like you getting your result. <laughs> Persuasion just sounds like a bad word. No, convincing. Like well, it sounds like a bad word because most people have used persuasion and convincing as synonyms when they're actually antonyms. <laughs> right? People resort to convincing because they're bad at sales. They're bad at persuasion. Okay. Persuasion is, like, if you desire to do something and then I empower you to do it, I've persuaded you. It's not about me coercing you. It's about me assisting you. It's about me guiding you. It's about me facilitating you. It's about me empowering you. It's about me educating you. It's about me enrolling you into your own idea and helping you believe that you're enough and you're worth it and you can do it. That's what it's about. That's what persuasion is about to me. Wow. Right? And so, so, so what is an offer? An offer is an opportunity that you give a potential client to exercise their desire to buy or otherwise obtain. The thing or the things you've helped them realize they've desired all along at a price that you've just previously decided on and they've subsequently agreed to, which they now expect to use to make their experience of life exponentially better. So let me go back to the beginning. It's an opportunity you give a potential client to exercise their desire to buy or otherwise obtain. So what if all people who were in sales started with the desire of the people they're selling to instead mm. of the desire that's inside of them, the desire that's outside of them? Okay. What's the last thing you can remember buying? Last thing I can remember buying Yes. And it could be as... I bought ice cream for my children last night. Okay. Did you buy anything to eat at the airport this morning? No. Okay. So you bought ice cream for your children last night. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did the ice cream person have to convince you to buy it? No. No. Why? Because you already desired to do that for who? For your children. Yeah. So the person who sells ice cream, sells ice cream, didn't have to convince you to buy the ice cream. You already desired to buy it. Well, we all have desire to buy, buy things from time to time. We have desire to acquire things from time to time. So I, I believe one of the biggest mistakes that people in the sales arena make is they go around looking for people to sell their stuff to, which to me is, is so much the cart before the horse. That might just be a cart and no horse. That might be pushing a cart uphill. It's like there's no horse anywhere to be found. Hmm. Okay, so... Instead of looking for people to sell stuff that you created that you like, instead of looking for people to sell stuff to, what if you made yourself more findable for people who already desire to buy what you already desire to sell? Because there are, there are, there are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands, potentially millions, potentially hundreds of millions of people in the world right now who would love to buy what you'd love to sell if they only knew you existed. Mm. So an offer is an opportunity you give to people who are looking. An offer is an opportunity that you give to people. I right. like the words you use. You're giving them an opportunity, opportunity. Right. to, to solve to, their own problem uh, using right. what you offer. You're using the solution that you've obsessed over. And so for me, like, I know the, the financial goodness that's in my I've got a lot of goodness in my life. I am blessed in so many ways. I'm blessed with a great family. I'm blessed, I'm just, I'm blessed with great health. I'm blessed with a lot of interests. I'm blessed with being physically coordinated enough to play golf at a <laughs> relatively high level for an amateur, right? Uh, I'm blessed to know how to play a musical instrument and like at least speak at several different languages. Like those are all blessings, but the financial blessings that are in my life, like the monetary blessings, the money, to be able to do what I desire to do and not have to think about how much it cost, that's all a result of one thing, offer mastery. I've mastered making offers. I don't ever have to go to a restaurant and read the menu from right to left. Oh, $7.62. Oh, chicken again. Right? I don't have to do that anymore. I can order whatever I desire to eat for me and for my spouse or if I take my entire family out to dinner or friends or whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, I can do it because I've mastered offers. Not because... I'm the Myron Gold, Dr. Myron Gold, not because I have nice suits, not because, you know, of any other thing. The number one thing that has made the most difference in my life financially, period, is making offers. You have your wife because you made her an offer. 
She has you because she made you an offer. Right? Yeah. Right? It's all, every, like, all the good stuff in your life, is, it, comes, it all comes from offers. Like your, your, your studio in, in Atlanta, you made somebody an offer on that building. You made a builder an offer to come renovate it for you. You did, I mean, you could have done it yourself, but it would have taken longer, right? <laughs> so you're like, okay, do I want to fix this place up myself or do I want to pay somebody to do it? This, like, this room looked nothing like this when I bought this building, right? And so, like, what happened? I made a contractor, I made a couple of different contractors some offers. They made it look exactly how I desired to make it look. And all I had to do was give them some money, sign me up. What are the elements of offer mastery? Like, if there's some check boxes that I have to check to make sure my offer is good well, yeah mm-hmm. that I'm delivering what are the check boxes well, it, I think it has to start with an awareness like everything starts with awareness right you have to you have to come to an awareness that offers matter offers matter right they matter like the people who, everybody watching us on YouTube you're watching on YouTube right now here's the reality you made your boss an offer for so many dollars an hour and they took it they made you an offer for so many dollars an hour and you took it Right? Everything you have in your life, you have because of an offer you've either accepted or rejected or, ma- or both or all of the above, right? Everything that you have in your life is a result of offers you've accepted and rejected. So it starts with an awareness. Oh, everything is an offer. Got it. So now, if somebody makes me an offer, I don't have to be offended. It's just an offer. I can say, I can tell them yes or I can tell them no. It's just an offer, right? If I make somebody an offer, there's no reason for them to get offended. They can tell me yes or tell me no. Yeah. I'm good either way. Like, I am not attempting to turn a no. I don't, like, so if I have awareness that it is an offer, awareness that, like, my only skin in the game is discovery, right? I'm not looking for a yes decision. I'm just looking for a decision when I have a conversation about an offer. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Like, <laughs> I, am, I am, I don't really, I, I don't have any vested interest in a yes. I could care less. I don't care. Why? Because I understand the law of averages. If I talk to so many people, a certain number of them are going to say yes. And I don't know what my average is, but if I talk to enough people, I'll figure out my average. Then I can apply the law of large numbers to the law of averages, and I win. <laughs> right? So, so it's, it's about awareness. Does that make sense first? It does. So once I come to the awareness, now I have a decision to make. Now that I'm aware of the fact that everything, is, like, everything good or bad in my life is the result of some offer I've made or accepted, right, or, re- or rejected, everything in my life, is a result of that. Wow. I know, right? It's that, I mean, it's I have like, my own realization. So listen, if y'all ever <laughs> seen me like looking up in the air or something, I'm, like, I'm going through my own stuff right now, okay? So just don't mind me. Go right. ahead. Okay. Um, like, for instance, you got on your Gucci prescription glasses. I mean. Right? You mean? No, they're Gucci. That's what it says on the side. <laughs> right? Okay. But they are prescription. Yes. Okay, so I didn't miss anything. Okay, good. So... <laughs> Are there eyeglass brands that s- sell for less than Gucci? Yes. So why would you opt for the more expensive glasses? Here's why. They made you a better offer. Hmm. Because the other ones, like the, the lesser expensive brands, they could help you see better. But the Gucci's helped you see yourself better. I ain't gonna lie to y'all. I was getting dressed today. <laughs> and then I have a couple different glasses. I looked in the mirror, I threw some on, I was like, ah, then I put these on, I was like, ooh. Let's go. I said, these the ones. <laughs> That's a true story, y'all. Yo, you said something to me one time that really changed my life, and then you said something that. <laughs> Hopefully, not that changed it back. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, so it, 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 it stuck with me, like, since you said it. Okay. But then you said something that made me think you're crazy. Oh, I am. Real crazy. Like, y'all okay. can't trust this guy. <laughs> <laughs> really? Let me tell the story, though. So the thing you oh, said gosh. was, the reason people haven't you paid you. No, I'm Because I'm hot. The reason, it's your studio. So uh-huh. okay. they need to work yeah, that out. The reason people haven't paid you $40,000, $50,000 is because you haven't made an offer for $40,000, $50,000. Sure. Okay. I remember saying that. 
That's, is that the one that made you think I was crazy? Or is no, that no, 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 no. That, that was the make... one that changed my life. Because I'm okay. like, if I have an offer, maybe the not offer everyone's going to take it. The offer you don't make is the offer they can't take. For sure. Okay. Here's the one that was like, I can't trust this guy. Okay. <laughs> he's out of his mind. He's just he's, throwing he's... stuff around at this point. He said, he said, I have a million dollar offer. Oh, I do have a million This was years ago. But at the time. I hadn't sold any. No one, had, no one bought it. Right. And I'm like, yo, why would he do that? Like, why, first off, you're just, now you're just putting stuff out there. A million dollar offer and nobody took it. In my mind, I was a hater at that moment. <laughs> I've, been to, I've been wanting to get this off my chest for a couple of years now, okay? Because it's been you festering. Crazy. I was like, yo, I was really hate on him. Like, yo, nobody's going to get this man a million dollars for coaching. I said that in my heart out of poverty mindset. It's okay. But then I realized that some people took the million dollar offer. Oh, Actually, yeah. I interviewed somebody who took the million dollar offer mm -hmm. and turned it into 28 million in three years yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And I, I mean, at that point, I stopped being a hater and now I believe it. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about that. A million dollar offer? Some people never make a million dollars in their life. Well, but why I bought, would I do bought that? a million dollar offer. I bought several, more than one million dollar offer in my life. Mm. Right, so I know that there are people who buy million dollar offers. I'm one of them. Right. Another hater moment. <laughs> so, okay. well, how can I offer somebody? How can I offer something to somebody that I'm not willing to participate in myself? If there's an offer that's a million dollars and I believe it's worth it and I don't pay for it, like I'd be a fraud if I. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not just because I didn't buy one, but if I believed it was worth a million and I didn't pay a million for it, now I'm I'm do I'm, I've got a double standard. One for you and one for me. I'm not going to do that. I even I even participated as a co-author in a um uh in a um what's anthology book, right? And I was the lead author, and I could have been in that I could have been in that book for free. Oh, uh, what's the anthology? Because okay. I know you don't okay. you don't know what that means, right? So Antho I'm, I'm looking out for you. I know, I know. Anthology. I know. An anthology is a book that has multiple authors. You got it. Okay. It's multiple authors in one. <laughs> authors, multiple okay, authors. Good. Okay. So, so I invited some of my students to be authors in that book, and I knew they were going to have to pay fifteen thousand dollars. So I paid fifteen thousand dollars, even though I didn't have to pay anything, because other people wanted to be in the book because I was in it. I'm not. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just. It's an observation, right? But I didn't want to pay. I didn't want my students to pay fifteen thousand dollars, and I didn't pay fifteen thousand yeah. dollars because I just felt like I don't. It wouldn't have been wrong, but I would have just felt yeah, mm -hmm. a little out of integrity. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Sure. So, um, so the offer you don't make is the offer they can't take. So if, if every if we realize like people do things for their reasons, not yours, Shan, not mm -hmm. mine. All I gotta do is discover their reasons. If I can discover your reasons. And then I can obsess over your problem and your reasons, and then I can fix it. Man, you ain't gonna have no problem at all paying me. Mm. Okay, another moment in my life where I hate it. Okay, so you've been doing guy, a lot of hating on I mean, I, but y'all hate too. Y'all just don't share it. I'm just <laughs> let me just let me just speak my truth. Okay, They're just don't laugh at me. Okay, no laughing. Okay, okay. It's a serious moment. Yeah. I have a good friend, Nehemiah Davis, okay. and. He, uh, he had like a program, I have a program, wasn't that good of a speaker. You know what I mean? I just, it was cool, but nothing crazy. So one day we're at, uh, I wanna say it was Marcus's wedding or something like that. And he showed me that he invested $55,000. He showed me the screenshot or the, of the wire, wire of him sending you $55,000. Mm -hmm. And I said, this man is crazy. Which one, him or me? No, I, both of y'all. <laughs> so I'm like, yo, why would you pay somebody $55,000? He's like, yo, to take me to the next level. I'm like, bro, there's better ways of doing that. Fast forward. He's in a program, and then he's on stage at an event. And I've never, ever seen him in this, it was like he was a different person on stage. Mm -hmm. So he calls up some of his students and he is on fire. He's running through the crowd. Mind you, he's never been a better speaker than me. Okay, that's the hater part. Because I'm like, you're definitely not better than me, first off. But like, he is going absolutely nuts and he makes an offer. And this is a big stage. Mm -hmm. 
people start running up to the stage to give this man $35,000. I remember it like it was yesterday. I said, what is going on here? I've only seen this at church. <laughs> only time I've ever seen this is at church. But he didn't say nothing about God. He was saying, I have an offer, and I want to say he said the number. Because I'm like, yo, there's no way they could have heard him say $35,000. <laughs> and they're still running up to pay this man. I am blown away. Mm -hmm. So he starts, after he's done, he takes these people in this private room, and there's a bunch of people walking with him, and then like a bunch of other people, and I'm trying to get next to Neo, and I'm like, yo, what did you do? What was that? <laughs> he said, oh, I, you know, like sell them from stage, learn from, I said, I, let me, how, how do I send the money? <laughs> I said, I want to send the money. And then I said, okay, well, I, I, I got on the phone with somebody the next day. And there's like, it's 55,000, you can do payment plans. So I'm like, yo, let me just give the money. And then my wife said, uh, I was telling my wife, I said, yo, I just signed up for this coaching program. And she said, how much was it? I said, 55,000. She said, what? <laughs> what do you get for $55,000? And I like, said, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know oh, when the classes are. I don't know if I get a court. I, but I want, I want to do that. I want to do that right there. I don't know where I was going with that story, but I had to get off my chest. Neil, I love you, man. You're my guy. But that, now, now I understand. But there's some people that won't understand until they see it. So Offer Mastery Live. Yeah. You, and I don't know how long we've been here. Maybe an hour. Yeah, hour and 21 minutes. But if, uh, f for what I got in an hour and 20 minutes, it's like almost, I can almost imagine what I can learn in three days from you. Mm. So what can I expect coming off from Master Life? You can expect to, be, to, to increase your awareness of how offers can change your life. You'll learn about the four different types of offers that could make you $100 or $100 million or somewhere in between. Mm. Um, there are four different types of offers that have to be mastered if you're going to build a successful business that scales. Um, you're going to learn from me, and I'm fairly good at offer mastery. Best I've ever seen. Okay, you're very, you're very kind. Thank you. You're going to learn from some of my friends and some of the people I've learned from. So you, have you ever read Daniel Priestley's book, Oversubscribed, Key Person of Influence? No, I haven't. Okay, okay. Game changer. Like, if you want to have like a multitude of people lined up out the door around the building, credit card in hand, ready to pay you for whatever you sell, Daniel Priestley's the guy. He's speaking. Mm. Okay. So Dr. Ben Hardy, who's the co-author of Who Not How, he's also the co-author of uh, 10X is Easier Than 2X. How'd you do that, bro? Because I, I tried to get him on my podcast and Who? I just couldn't. Who, Ben? Yeah, man. Oh. Would you like me to talk to him for you? Yes. Okay. Please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tried, but uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. That was selfish. I made, ahead, it, I made, I made him an offer. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, it's so he's speaking. But here's here's a part of my favorite part of the event. I've got a bunch of my students who've mastered or gotten closer to mastering making offers who are speaking. And like I've got one person speaking on, you know, you can make money with soft offers. What's a soft offer? It's, it's an offer that, that has nothing to do with making money or losing weight or like finding the love of your life. It's like it's not in the it's not in the, th the big three. Right. Um, I've got somebody else coming who's going to be talking about like how to make like one offer that makes you more money than a thousand offers. Right. So I've, mm -hmm. all, and these are all students like a lot of my different students I've got one who's going to be talking about um, um, like how to fast track your wealth by making offers. So there are, there are a bunch of students. I'm going to be speaking a lot. I'm probably going to speak for, I think, somewhere between six and ten hours of, out of the three days. I'm going to be speaking the most. Um, but I've got a bunch of students. I've got a bunch of. And then you're going to be interviewing me there. Yes. At Offer oh, Mastery yeah. Live. It's going to be gonna crazy. Clap? You're, you're, you're not going to clap? That's cool. No, forget that. It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> You're a wild man. You're a wild man. So. Oh, and I didn't complete the story. So actually, oh. um, after coming to after wiring the workshop, me the fifty-five thousand yes. dollars, right, and telling your wife you didn't know what you got. First off, the concept was just wild because I get in the room and we're talking about not how to make six figures in a year, but how to make it in a day. Right. And then I thought you were really crazy. Right. I'm like, there's no. How do you other than robbing a bank? How do you do that?
<laughs> and then there's people that make a million dollars in a day. Right. And there's and I'm like, all right, well, this is some concept that I think could work. But then it's people standing up that's getting these awards, like y'all a million in a day, five million in a day. And I just didn't understand until okay. I made a million in a day. Okay. Right, exactly. Then it kind of opened up. I just did everything that like that you you taught a bunch of them. We have our own little group. You weren't in the group. It was our group. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't add you to the group chat, it was our own little group. And it's just million. And I can show you this. And then it somehow the group name got changed to $10 million a day. And I said, I got to get out of here. <laughs> this is too much going on. But literally, uh, I've been able to do it over and over sure. um, again using the strategy because I just didn't understand that that stuff is possible. So right. hey, listen, y'all really- It started really, with an awareness though, didn't it? 100%. And then after the awareness, then what happened? Then you had a decision, mm -hmm. right? And then you had the discipline to follow through on that decision. So you said, well, how does a person learn how to master offers? It starts with an awareness, then a decision, and then the discipline to focus on that decision and ignore all distractions. Yeah. That's, where you, that's how you ma learn to master anything. Yeah. Awareness, decision, discipline. I think it's important everybody spends three days. That's a different kind of ADD. Over. Oh, God. <laughs> I think everybody needs to make a decision to spend three days mastering an offer because this can and will truly change your life. This is the first step, I think, of obsession. You have to come. You got to mm -hmm. be in the room. Mm -hmm. You cannot get rich on a webinar. You can't get rich watching this video. Right. You literally, even. You have to in become the a. If, Jim Rohn said, I, and I quoted him a lot today, but he said, if somebody gives you a million dollars, you best become a millionaire so you get to keep the money. Here's what I've discovered. Becoming the person who can make the millions comes before making the millions. Become the person. What are you gonna get at Offer Mastery Lab? You're gonna become the person. How? You're gonna, you're gonna develop a new level of awareness that you've never had before mm -hmm. that hopefully will cause you to make a decision that's worth disciplining yourself to pursue. Wow. Yeah, also, I got kind of, this is last time, last hater moment. So my, um, one of my employees, you know, he edits the videos. Mm -hmm. And for one, he was like, y'all need off these days to go to Offer Mastery Live. I'm like, first off. <laughs> you know what I mean? First off. Oh, I got in I trouble. Just taking three I got days in off. trouble. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and then he didn't even use my link. You know what I mean? And I'm like, yo, bro, what's up? What's what you, are you doing? But he's coming. So, I mean, my, I, I, it, but I was really, really proud to know that, like, something changed in this person that says, I want more. Mm. I want more out of life. And he made a decision. And I was just super proud. So, you making a decision? Yes, David. Good. Use my link. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm making offers. What, what is your link? Um... You can look. That's fine. You can look. It's, oh, yes. So I, can use my, I wasn't going to use my link, but since I need to make an offer. Social proof mastery? Right, look, don't, don't guess, bro. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Hey, don't, hey, guess. don't, don't do it. You're typing yeah, in all kinds of stuff. I'm about, to, I'm about to find it right now. Say something else cool while I find it. Um, <laughs> He's so good at Everybody who's stuff. watching right now, you're one offer away from changing your life. Like, I, like all the offers I have now, it started with what? I started with what? One offer. I started with one offer. It's, it, it, so I'm going to share with you. I'll share this at Offer Mastery Live as well, though. Um, so I just found we're looking at a bunch of different real estate acquisitions right now. So I found one that I'm going to buy. It's a farm, 10-acre farm. And basically... I'm just going to make an offer to pay for it. Like, it's, it sounds like, like everything that I pay for in my life, I pay for with an offer. So my Rolls Royce out there costs me no more than this bottle of water. Everything costs the same amount. Why? Because I pay for everything according to my creativity. What does that even mean, pay for everything according to my creativity? First of all, notice what I did not say. I did not say I pay for it with my creativity. I did not say I pay for it from my creativity. I did not say pay for it out of my creativity because if I would have said any one of those things, after I paid for it, I'd have less creativity left over than I had before I created it, <laughs> right? But I said I, create, I pay for it according to my creativity. So if I pay for it according to my creativity, I create an offer to pay for the thing. 
I make the offer, I collect the money, I spend the money to buy the thing, so now I have the thing, but guess what else I still have? I still have the offer and I still have the creativity. <laughs> Here's what's beautiful. If you right now are exchanging time for money, you're exchanging time for money, everything feels expensive to you because you feel like you're paying for everything with your life because you are. And you look, if you make $50,000 a year and you look at a $50,000 car, you're asking yourself, is this worth a year of my life? If you look at a $200,000 house, is this worth four years of my life? Well, if you look at the price of gas, whatever, everything is like a life equation. Well, for me, so when you, when you exchange time for money and you buy things with money that you exchange your time for, you have less money and you have less time. You don't have the time anymore that you use to make the money and you don't have the money anymore, so you always have less because you're exchanging a limited resource called time for a physical res I mean for a financial resource so you you it's impossible to get ahead but when you pay for things according to your cre creativity you create offers to pay for things you spend the money that you got paid from the offer you get the thing that you paid for but you still have the offer mm -hmm. and you can keep selling and not only do you still have the creativity that you have that you created the offer with you actually have more creativity so when you learn to pay for things with offers, buying things actually makes you wealthier, not poorer. Game mm. changer. Socialproofoml.com. Socialproofoml.com. Social You're not going to write it down? Go to socialproofoml.com. I'm on you. Socialproofoml.com. Offer mastery live. Talk to them people on YouTube, bro. Why are you messing with me? Listen. <laughs> because, you, listen, you. there is a time that you're going to have to start making decisions. And I think it's a lack of decisions because um, you don't want to fall to one side or you're thinking, well, maybe I have something else to do and it's not even on your schedule. Or the thing that you have on your schedule is not as important as the rest of your life or the well-being of your children or your ability to do all the philanthropic things that you want to do with your life. So some of you all are going to have to tell this story of how I was going to my friend's birthday party in Cancun, but I decided to cancel. They were mad for a little bit, but the very next birthday, I was able to pay for the whole thing because I decided to make a decision. Come on, you man. need to be at All for Mastery Live. Paint that I'm picture, Shams. coming. Paint that picture, Shams. Come on, I learned it from you. That was good, right? That was good. Social proof, OML, okay? Uh, make sure you use that link. But yes, y'all need, need to be... How many of you have their tickets already? Okay, let me ask this question. How many people don't have their ticket, but there's no real reason why you don't have your ticket? You just didn't do and, it. And, and more important than the ticket... Is I mean it's, that's important because you gotta have a ticket to get in. Yeah. But more important than the ticket is the room block like expires on the 24th, and you'll end up paying twice as much for a room at the JW Marriott as you will if you get it according to. Is our that on the website? It's somewhere. Yeah. Because I don't want. I'm I'm a delayer. Don't I'm delay right now. I'm gonna listen. Don't I'm delay. going to get my room right now. Right. Get your room now. Right. Absolutely. Right. Make it so happen. let's make a decision. There's no reason. There's no reason. You just don't make quick decisions. Right? People, you, are you a decision maker? Oh, yeah. And once I decide, it's a wrap. There is no going back. It's just, it is what it is. Like, some people think I'm stubborn because I'm decisive and determined. But I don't really Why care do what they think. Why do you think you're stubborn? Because I, once I make a decision, I don't change it. Like, no, I already mm. said no. Like, if I already said no, my no is a hard no. It's not a soft no. It's not a maybe not. It's like, leave me alone. I already said no. Why are you wasting my time now? If I say yes, it's already a yes. Hmm. Yeah. And so what most people do, though, is they make choices and they don't make decisions. That's, that's a big problem that a lot of people they have. make choices and don't make decisions. Yes. And they're not the same thing. Choose means to pick one. Decide comes from the Latin root de and side. De means of or from. Side means to cut. So when you decide, you cut yourself off from any other possibility. So, wow. whereas choose means pick one. You can change your mind back and forth 17 times if you choose. But once you decide, it's a wrap. I, I heard something somewhere. I think it was a, I don't, I don't know what book it was, but I, years and years ago. Um, and it said, successful people make this. quick decisions and are slow to turn away. Mm -hmm. But unsuccessful people, it takes them forever to make a decision, but they're quick to turn away from that decision. 100%. I've been work ever since I've been working on. Let's just make the decision quick. Right. 
and not waver in the storm to say, okay, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think once I understood that, my career took. It was like a wrap. Absolutely. Cool. That's what's up. This is a good conversation, right? Conversation. I, do we have time to take a cut? Thanks. That was good. Yeah, we, do we, do we, we have, have time a, to take questions? The, do we have a hot mic for the audience, y'all? We have a hot mic for the audience. We do. Okay. So who's going to run the mic? You got some questions? Uh, um, Mariah, can you run the mic? Got that way, first hand back there. What's your name? Because I'm going to stop attacking you. I'm pointing at you. Say it again. Leticia? Alicia. 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 Okay. So who's got a question? This gentleman. Okay. In the back. What's your name? Theo. Theo. Hey, great session. Um, you are a master at ans asking questions. It comes naturally he, to he you. Because you, you were thinking questions I had in my mind before I even thought of them. Wow. So when you said offer mastery, you already were practicing that because you didn't have nothing written down. You remember the questions he asked. You went back to the previous questions. So you were the really, perfect bro, example. This has nothing to do with you. I just want to know. So <laughs> it's a selfish situation. So. But, but, but you're speaking as if I was sitting there talking because those are the questions I wrote those questions down literally on here. So really don't have too many questions. But one of the questions I do have is you mentioned like going deeper, you know, into the offer and you got to get do it enough time so you get good at it sure how do you know to keep going deeper or maybe you need to pivot a little bit with some of your offering and stuff like that that's always a challenge in my yeah. mind so there are there are a bunch of different ways but the best way is to find somebody who um i learned it in multi-level marketing so if you have conversations and you've got somebody watching you right first you watch them do it then you do it with them then they watch you do it so like a good way to do it would be to record your calls, and then if you have a coach, have the coach watch the calls, and then they can point out where you've, um, where you've like, got a little sidetracked. Good, great question. Thank you. I appreciate it. So just keep going and then having that coach sure. or someone and recording. Sure. And, See and, if you can and, go. And, there's and, more nuance right. into what you're doing. It, and, 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 and most importantly, like when you're talking to people, watch their energy. Right, watch their energy so that you can see when their energy becomes begins to be disconnected, and then take inventory of what you were doing at that time and don't do that anymore. Yeah, good stuff, Theo. Okay, Thank right, right in front of you, right in front of you, Trudy. Oh, Alicia was next. I'm sorry. Yeah, she, she's, no, she's, already, she's already. Walk got, in she, decency Trudy's and got, order. Trudy, go ahead. Um, <laughs> so you talked about how uh, you paid that fifty-five thousand and. I can tell you right now the, the, big, the most expensive thing I paid for was when I joined the boot camp with Myron. And he had said he is giving us the opportunity to spend more. And I'm like, I, the way he worded it, it's like I've now been able to ask a bigger price because I've sure. paid the bigger price. Sure, and I, I've seen, I know Myron did that, that million dollar payout for oh, his own right. coach. I know he's done it. So it's like, you give your, he was right. I didn't think that was, a, but it's true. The moment you level up, level up, it's you give you yourself permission other, to. It's to, easier for you to expect other people to level yeah. up. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. If you ex Absolutely. see people who are unwilling to pay are unable to charge. That's what people don't realize because it's, it, it's not that it's not that that's all there is to it. Like just paying doesn't give you the right to charge. But if you're unwilling to pay, you will be like you won't even know how somebody feels when they're writing a check or using a credit card or wiring money for that amount. So you don't you don't even you can't even address the concerns that they have because you've not allowed yourself to step into that arena. That's good. But the other thing is when you sell somebody something for any price, like be good, like deliver a good result. Don't just sell them something because you can charge the money. Like deliver on the promises. Anyway, may I do a question and a half? I, I've never, I'd never experienced that before. <laughs> I'm well, interested well, to know what it looks I'll like. Let, I'll let, I'll, okay, yeah, Dave, I, I want to know, know what the question half is. So. Okay, perfect. So the actual question for is for Myron. Sorry, David. Um, so, <laughs> Myron, we speak about doing things prior to being ready, but we've also spoken on ensuring that we are no, obsessing mm -hmm. over people's problems. Sure. How do we bridge that gap? Um, that's a really, really good question. Is that the half or is that the question? That's the actual question. Okay, that's the actual question. Um, I think sometimes we can't discover whether we're ready or not until we endeavor to do the thing. And then when we do the thing and it doesn't turn out the way we thought it would turn out, then we know we're not. We discover that we weren't as ready as we thought we were and we go and prepare some more. But remember, even before I said that, I said it's a quest 
for bettering your best. Good, better, best, never let it rest to your good is better, your better is best. You can be really, really good at something and still work on getting better. So you can be ready and still prepare more after you're ready. And people talk about being overprepared. Like, I don't know that I've ever experienced that. Hmm. I've, I've experienced being so prepared that it's hard for me to fumble, but I don't feel like that's overprepared. I think, I think when you have more than you need to use, you're not overprepared, you're prepared enough to be good this time and still have enough left over to be good next time. That's good. Was that helpful? Yes, it was. Thank okay. you. Um, David. Okay. This is I'm the half? You, you get the half. That's crazy. You get the half. <laughs> is it just a clarity question? Um, did you already get your ticket? I was, I was feeling as if you had. That's good. I'm speaking there. Oh, okay. So and, you don't actually need a ticket. For nothing. <laughs> it's just free. But you don't like have a hotel. hotel. Though. I am a hotel, though. Next year, when you speak, you won't have to get a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there won't be a next year. This is my last one. Really? Oh, I'm done. Oh, wow. Yeah, really? yeah. If you don't come to this one, you ain't coming to an Offer Mastery Live. Because <laughs> this is the last one. Why is this the last one? Um, honestly? Yes. Because I have to be true to the things I teach people. And one of the things I teach people is build your business in a way that it serves you at the highest level. So it gives you the energy and bandwidth to serve your clients at the highest level. And me doing a live event of this magnitude does not serve me at the highest level. All the conversations that I have to have with all the people, production, hotels, and all the back and forth, I hate it. Mm. So this, I, I love y'all, but I hate this. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't need the money, and I don't need to do a live event, and I don't need the notoriety. I don't need people to think I'm awesome. So... Like, I can serve more people online than I can serve in a physical location. But when, I, when, I get, when we do the physical location, it's going to be epic. Yeah. But I'm done. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hey, how you doing? Fantastic. How you All doing? right. I want to word this right because it is a question. Okay. Um, it's something I feel like I've overcome, but sometimes getting pe people around me to overcome it too. Sure. So one thing that you always say is like everything in the Bible supports another truth that's in the Bible. Sure. They all work together. Sure. So you know there's the, the passage in the Bible about not worrying about tomorrow, right? right. Today you'll be provided enough for today. Sure. Um, and so that's kind of well, a and, and, and In fact, the Bible says don't worry about anything. Yeah. Not yeah. tomorrow or anything else. Okay. Yeah. Just today sure. you'll have enough for today, right? right? So it's like if I'm somebody, somebody I made a million dollars today and I'm in a rush to invest in that $350,000 program and somebody might say, you just made it, like don't invest. But what I found is the more seeds I plant, the more it just keeps coming and you okay. almost don't have to be overprepared. So, so but what's people the question? Are, the people are going to struggle with confidence in those, in faith in those biblical principles or feel like sometimes they contradict each other. So right, what would you say to that person? Well, I would say that the thing that contradicts the Bible is your misunderstanding of the Bible. So, so, peop, so for instance, the Bible says don't worry about tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean don't prepare for tomorrow. The same Bible that says don't worry about tomorrow. Take no thought means don't worry, don't have anxiety about tomorrow. That same Bible says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Right? It says, a good man foreseeth evil and hideth himself, but the foolish pass on and are punished. So we have to understand that those different passages are talking about different things to different people at different times in different contexts. So I'm never supposed to worry about anything, but I'm supposed to step into every arena I step into as prepared as I possibly can. Does that make sense? Good question. Yeah, that's good. Well, Deborah. Yes, Hi. So my question's for you, Myron. You mentioned that there were three types of offers, one of which was a soft offer that had nothing to do with making money. Can you touch on that a little bit? Oh, so soft offers are offers. So the offer, well, I don't want to give it away before, but there are offers that people have that don't have anything to do with making money. So I've got a client right now. She's in my uh, VIP Plus program, which is a $350,000 coaching, coaching program. Um, but she, her offer is she teaches people how to get control over their alcohol addictions in particular, but over addictions in general. That's a soft offer, right? And when she first started coaching with me back in 2019, um, she didn't have an offer. She just had an event and she created this workbook that she was gonna work with people through for free. And I said, like, she said, do you have any tips for me? Yeah, what are you selling? She said, I'm not selling anything. She had 170 people come to an event. I said, that is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I said, what are you doing if I'm not making an offer? She said, oh, I'm just gonna go through this 80 page workbook. I said, can I coach you? She said, yeah. I said, that's the second worst idea I've ever heard in my life. She said, what should I do? I, well, I, what I would do is I would take that 80-page manual and turn it into a coaching program. She said, how much should I sell it for? I said, I don't know. How much would make you happy? She said, $4,000. I said, great, sell it for six grand. She said, what? 
Yeah, sell it for six grand. I said, are there solutions out there that cost more than that? Yeah, there are rehabs that cost $30,000 for 30 days. Okay. I thought you said you love these people. I do. Okay. I thought you said that you're the best and your transformations last longer than anybody's. I am and they do. So if you're the best and you're their best chance at recovering from addiction, why would you send them home without a solution that they've paid for? Because if they don't pay for it, they're not going to pay attention to it. Why would you send them home to go spend $30,000 on something that's going to work half as good or less than half as good as what you have? She said, well, that makes sense. So she turned her 80-page workbook into a manual. She had 170 people show up. She did $264,000 in sales. Well, she just did an event in Tampa last month where a bunch of people came in. She's creating a movement now, and she made an offer. She had a million-dollar day with a soft offer. And she's not even the one speaking on soft offers. She's going to talk, she's going to talk about how to overcome your internal resistance to making offers. That's what she's going to be talking about. It's going to be great. And, 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 and by the way, of all the people I've ever coached, she's had probably more internal resistance to, over, to overcome than anybody else I've ever coached. She grew up in a cabin in Colorado with no running water, no electricity out. Like, so she grew up like, and she's younger than me, right? But she's overcome that resistance to making people offers. And so you can't help people by protecting them from your transformation if you have a transformation because it costs money. That doesn't help people. So hopefully that was helpful, Deborah. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, um, over here, side. over here. Uh, YouTube Lynn, y'all good? Y'all all right? Yeah, y'all good on YouTube? Yeah, I think they're Let's all right. Let's go. I, I'm still seeing fire emojis, so we good. <laughs> so, Kenny, you, talk to me, brother. You asked us to remind you about the foundational principle to help people in MLM, so that's one. But I my, was getting there, bro. My actual question. You know I mean? Okay, Don't you remember. my thunder acting like I forgot. Or you told us to remind you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get to it. But my question is, so like, we have a coaching program, and we have students that come through, follow the steps, get the result, and then we have students who don't follow the steps or don't do anything. Sure. How can, how can we make, like, I could just be like, well, a percentage of people don't follow directions, and so it is what it is. But sure. how can we get better and make it so it's I guess, easier for people to... One thing you could do is interview the people who don't follow the steps and find out why. Like, find out why. And then, whatever their answers are, fix those things. That'd be a good place to start. Um, with regard to the foundational principle in multi-level marketing, this is true for insurance, this is true for real estate, this is true for coaching, this is true if you want to be a best-selling author. The most important component of being successful in network marketing is this, or any offer for that matter. Who is the person that brought the offer, right? That's the thing that has more to do with the conversion or the persuasion than any other thing. Who is the person who brought it? For instance, Kenny, let's say you got a call. I'm going to use Shans because he's on camera and you're not on camera. So I'm going to use Shans. Okay. okay. Let's say you got a call from Damon John okay. office today. It wasn't him, but he's like, Mr. Shans, um, Damon John has been watching your podcast. He loves it. Um, he's getting ready to mentor 12 people, entrepreneurs. His goal is to help them become somewhere between a hectamillionaire and a billionaire, okay? Hectamillionaire being over $100 million, billionaire over a billion, a thousand million, a billion. Um, and he's considering you, would you like to be considered for this program, what would you say? Yes. Yes, okay. Notice what his answer was. His answer was yes. His answer was not, how much does it cost? What do I have to do? Where do I have to go? Like, what do I have to stop doing? None of those, none of those questions. He just said yes. Why did he say yes? Why did you say yes before you knew any of those details? Because of who brought it to you. Yeah, for sure. So the most important component of any offer is to become the person people say yes to before they know what your offer is. Take notes. And then only offer them offers that provide real transformation so that when your reputation precedes you, your reputation does not exceed you. Was that helpful? Yes. This is so good. This is so good. Any other questions before we wrap up? Um, Myron, thank you. For thank this. you. Thank, thank you for you. coming down from, from Atlanta to hang out and chop it up. No. It was fun, man. Thank you for letting me use my affiliate link. 
on this interview. <laughs> I didn't expect it. It was, you know, that was a surprise. But go to socialproofoml.com. And um, is there anything that you want to say to the people who are, uh, they're still trying to figure out if they believe in themselves enough to go become successful? Yeah. Get around somebody who believes in you more than you believe in yourself and borrow their belief to build your own. And so I, I believe that the most important component that any coach can have in their players or in the people they coach is to believe in the team's ability to win more than the team themselves believe in it. Um, and like I believe in the infinite capacity of human capability and human potential, even though most people don't even scratch the surface. Mm. It's, it's in there. But most people are unwilling to become the person who takes it out. Wow. So. Yeah, you know what's interesting, too? Last point is when we think about You know about this is your farting, third last point, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> have I had a bunch of last points? Oh, yeah. But it's okay. You can have some. I didn't realize You're David Chan. You're, you're, um, I was... When you said find someone that believes in you, yes, my mind goes to the person who doesn't have anyone to believe in them, family, friends, things of that nature, right? But I think my family and friends didn't believe in me because they're my family and friends. But then I meet somebody like you who has no idea who I am. And you're like, whoa, you got all the stuff. And then you believed in me right. and allowed me to believe in me regardless of the people who know me believed in me. So when you say get around people who believe in you, it's probably going to be people that you don't have a close relationship with. Oh. Before God called Abram to the promised land, he called him out of the familiar land. Yeah. Wow. A prophet is not without honor save in his own kin country and among his own kin. Sometimes the people who believe in you the least are the people who know you the most. Because if they believe in you once that means you're more than they thought you were. Now they're challenged to become more than they think they are. Mm. And that challenge can be very, very painful. Wow. Myron Golden, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you. That was fun. All right, get, get your ticket to Offer Mastery Live. Where are you going to go? Again? Socialproofoml.com. Oscar Mary Lima, let's go. I'll be in there. Oscar Michael Lima, sorry. Oscar Michael Lima. Anyway, all right, brother. Appreciate it. Okay. All right, guys. We're out of here. Do your thing. Shans, what an interview, bro. Oh, man. You did, most, you did all the work. Uh, mine.